it's a really complicated question about whether Russia can win or not. It's also so early in the war. We're just, you know, three months in. Um, so many things can still happen. And also, there is another aspect to this. So Russia is running out of people unless it uh, calls up a large number of reservists and maybe conscripts. It stands to lose even more hardware, which is hard to replace and is going to be even more difficult to replace with Western sanctions in place. But that doesn't mean that Russia is going to definitively lose. And it also doesn't mean conversely that Ukraine will definitively win because Ukraine has stated that victory would mean getting back all the land on, that was under Ukrainian control as of February 23rd, so the day before the, the Russian invasion. That's a very tall order and is very hard to do and harder to do than defending territory. It's not to say that it's not possible, but Russia losing is not necessarily the same as Ukraine winning. And I think that one thing that most experts agree on and most observers agree on is that this is going to go on for quite some time. It seems that it's going down well, honestly, the US is so bogged down in its own domestic problems. Uh, Roe v. Wade, the uh, Supreme Court decision from 1973 that guaranteed women the right to an abortion is about to be struck down, it seems. Inflation is at a historic high. We just had a round of primaries for what are going to be probably quite contentious uh, midterm elections in, in November of 2022. Um, this is, I think, one of the, you know, Sweden and Finland are one of the last things I think on people's minds. And it's relegated mostly, I think, to the people who think about this mm -hmm. for a living, the foreign policy, national security professionals. Personally, I think that it is yet another example of what a bad strategist Putin is. I think for the longest time, Americans have made Putin out to be this 10 foot tall, perfect supervillain and the Russians behind him to be, you know, 12 feet tall supervillains who perfectly plan and execute all these um, subversive plans to undermine the West. And they do undermine the West, but it's not, you know, I think he has shown himself in this to be a rather poor strategist and even tactician. I mean, if, if your goal was to defeat NATO and to weaken NATO, all he's done is strengthen it and brought it even closer to its borders than it was before. There's the issue of the blockade on the Black Sea uh, coast where Ukraine has many ports from which this grain sets sail for the rest of the world. It's also very hard to get things in or out of Russia in part because, of, excuse me, of Ukraine, in part because Russia is bombing railways and strategic uh, points where to stop the flow of weapons from the West to Ukraine. Um, there's also the issue of fighting happening in large parts of kind of open space in Ukraine where grain is grown. And the question is, will the situation in these areas be stable enough for people to plant crops, to tend to them, to harvest them, to process them? Or is the, are the front lines going to keep moving back and forth and prevent people from doing so? I don't think it's, uh, you know, this isn't new for Putin to be weaponizing something so fundamental, you know, in 2015, 2016, when Putin, sent Russian forces into Syria, he very clearly weaponized refugee flows from Syria to undermine Europe, to undermine the West. Um, and it's arguably one of the things that led to Brexit and a kind of crack in the facade of EU unity. So this would not be the first time that Putin would weaponize human suffering for his own political goals. Well, I, I have to say that I'm very lucky in that most of my family is not in Russia anymore and most of my friends are not in Russia anymore. A lot of them emigrated a long time ago or have fled since the war has started. Uh, the people at, 
that are that I'm close to who are still in Russia, I'm also lucky that they are sane, worldly people who understand the difference between good and evil and truth and fiction. What I'm finding though, is that they are very careful in how they discuss it with me because this is happening over messenger. And I'm very careful when I discuss it with them so as to not put them in a position where they would say something that would later get them in trouble. But they've been pretty outspoken with me about their opposition to the war, but also how they feel uncomfortable and scared to speak about their opposition to the war more publicly because so many people around them support it and because it is now punishable for by up to 15 years in jail if you contradict what the government is saying, if you're spreading quote unquote fake news about the war. So there's a real sense of fear and a real sense of isolation and loneliness and terror in these people because they don't uh, they don't agree with what their government is doing. They're horrified by what their government is doing, but they also feel terrified to speak up against it because they feel like they're the only ones that they know that oppose the war and that they will suffer the consequences for opposing it without really changing anything. 